WPVM 103.7 on your dial and at WPVMFM.org globally. I am your host, Crystal Salinas McKinnon, and today we are doing the third in our series of interviews for the NC Congressional race with Republican candidate Wendy Navarez who is joining me live in the studio today. Wendy is taking on the incumbent Madison Cawthorn in the Republican primary. Please note that you can also view this broadcast both live and archived on the WPVM Facebook page and website. So, Wendy, unlike your Democratic counterparts, your focus, I assume, is weighed even more heavily on the primary race since it's fairly rare for an incumbent to lose in the primary. Yes, it is. So what motivated you to run for Congress as a Republican in this particular race? So I had dabbled with the ideas of uh, running for office during the course of my master's program in public administration. Um, and I would say the turning point for me where I knew I was going to have to take some action and move forward was around January 6th. Mm. So um, so it was the insurrection and, and the response to that? Yes. Yes, it was. And uh, I felt obligated um, as prior military, you know, uh, I saw... I saw that our democracy was being attacked and I had already vowed to uphold the constitution and, um, and I'll continue to do that. Have you always been a Republican? I have for 20 years. So um, what, before that you were just a kid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I'm not too terribly. Yeah. Were you born into a Republican family or was it a personal choice? It was a personal choice. Um, I would say we were probably split down the middle, but but that was a time where it didn't matter, and you could still have conversations at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So, if you were to win the primary, what would your strategy be going forward from that? Are you counting on quote traditional Republicans and independents who might be uncomfortable with Cawthorn's image and performance? Because um, I mean, one does wonder. Given that Cawthorn is a proven liar, changes his positions as the wind blows, is uh, accused of sexual assault, has no education, military, or work experience, and perpetrates stolen valor, uh, do people even care? I think they do. I think they do. And I would say I'm counting on everybody, not just Republicans, not just unaffiliated or independent. I'm counting on everybody because this is our democracy. I just feel like, you know, in the case of Trump, you know, when the grab them by the P word tape came out, you know, many of us thought, oh, he's finished, you know, but mm -hmm. no one cared. And it really calls into question, um, especially from sort of an outside perspective, what morality is left in the party? Um, I mean, do you think people want a return to the kind of family values image of the past in the party. Uh, what are you hearing from folks on the ground that you're speaking to? Well, that was what I was going to say. I've spent the last month going around the district, just having small group conversations. And the majority of them happen to be uh, Republican. I didn't plan that. It was really just a uh, kind of an open forum, going to w meet people where they are. Um, and I would say that, you know, there's some disappointment in the fact that the family values, the moral compass, truthfulness is not um, the foundation and, and what we're leaning on. So, yeah, I, I would definitely say that uh, that that's something that that most of Western North Carolina is uh, worried about and, and including the party. OK, <clears throat> how are you? Um, I know you said that you're trying to meet people where they're at. So um, as far as that's concerned, how are, how are you reaching the more rural communities um, and the people who are often left out of the political process? So I've spent the last uh, few weekends um, in the last two months just driving out to different locations, not really promoting it. Just I wanted to literally get the people who 
are from that area, ask them their concerns, um, and just get the raw, you know, information from the constituents there. So, and what kind of um, <clears throat> what kind of concerns are you hearing most frequently? Well, right now it's you know they feel like their representation is tarnished mm-hmm. uh, due to our current representative. So they they want, you know, my motto is truth, honor, and service, and they want to see that back in Western North Carolina. Okay. So this is sort of a joke question, but really quickly before we move on, do okay. you believe the recent elections were free and fair? I do believe they were free and fair. Okay. I, I will add that there's fraud in any federal uh, or state run anything, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, I mean, you can't be 100% free from that. But there's never uh, a situation where that I've seen, or data I've seen, that would show that uh, it would have swayed the election one way or another. So you do consider Joe Biden our president? I do. Okay. I I just think our, you know, our listeners, they want to know that probably. Yes, (laughs) (laughs) ma'am. So running as a Republican, if your Democratic opponent was to be a moderate Democrat, how would you differentiate yourself? Um, Because I don't, from what I know of you, you're not what we would call far right at this point. Um, So there could potentially not be huge differentiation between the two platforms Mm -hmm. because I think, you know, most of the Democrats are also targeting that sort of disaffected Republican or independent group. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, So I would definitely say the main thing that differentiates me is how money is spent. Mm -hmm. So I'm very uh, fiscally responsible. Uh, I have managed budgets. I have done accounting. Uh, I've done that in the military. I've done it in private sector at a manufacturing plant. So for me, it's, um, it's about making sure we don't overspend our means, you know, I mean, it sounds great to give everybody health care. And, you know, I agree they, you know, everybody should have that and broadband and things, but there are finite resources. So it has to be a well laid out plan to make certain things happen for the people. Okay. Well, let's get into some of your policies. Okay. Um, let's see. So you are a veteran of the United States Navy. I think you served for 11 years. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. So what would you, as a veteran especially, consider your position to be on the United States relationship with the world? Like, what is your overall philosophy on international relations and interventions? Yeah. So in the military outside of thinking what the military is, which is a, a war fighting machine, you know, we go and we fight battles. We're also, we do a lot of humanitarian work uh, wherever we go. And so I think of it like that. Um, you know, we're spreading the word of democracy and we're showing it through our actions. Um, so I think that's something that our, you know, outside of the military, our government has to do as well. Um, so I would say, for instance, when it comes to China and their current one party, um, one party uh, government, you know, we have to convince them that democracy, having plurality, ha- you know, having multiple voices is a benefit um, and we can't take it out on the people. You know, the people of China aren't the problem right now. It's, you know, it's the government and we have to be able to to convince people. Uh, You don't do that by, you know, threats or, you know, you have to you have to do it through diplomacy. So. So are you saying that you believe that the United States should pursue democratizing other countries, especially like another hegemonic state like China? Mm hmm. Um, I, I believe it has been healthy for us thus far. Um, and when when we're operating in um, a well-balanced way where everybody's voice is included, then it does work. And, and so not forcing, but again, diplomacy saying, you know, let's look at this. Um, 
how can how can we help you you know to do better because some of your people aren't happy i'm just you know. just guessing they don't want our advice <laughs> probably <laughs> but so yeah. Cawthorn is very America first. He literally mm -hmm. has the term America first on his website. And um, it's a pretty right wing concept. Yes. Um, so he claims to think that China has infiltrated the highest levels of government in the United States and asserts that Biden, who he calls, quote, far left, which is comical, is bending the knee. Um, so I know you support bringing manufacturing home and, um, reducing our, our dependence on Chinese manufacturing, but is your view as, I mean, I don't know how else to put it as hysterical as Cosmorns in like, is, is China, in what ways is China a threat to the United States in the way that he's asserting, like, that they're infiltrating? And when he says the top levels of government, he's implying that it's, like, in the Oval Office. Yes, I understand. It's hard to even answer that question because, you know, Joe Biden has been in government for so, you know, for so long that he knows how to get along with people and still make things happen for himself. You know, that's a part of it. Um, and so I think being new to politics, um, Cawthorn probably believes that, uh, and I haven't interacted with him enough or at all, actually, uh, other than the way everybody else does. Um, it's probably, you know, that approach that you can attack someone and then still expect them to have a conversation with you and and compromise and give you, you know, some of what your party wants. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, uh, again, back to diplomacy, right? So we have to be able to get along well enough. Doesn't right. mean you have to agree with people. Right. And uh, I know you're very against um, attack, you know, nasty attacks very much so um and you know just vile language and mockery and all that stuff yes i am so it's, that's it's unnecessary it's not going to get us anywhere right and and some might say it's undignified it's very undignified so okay let's move on to uh the war on terror should it have ever happened and should we have pulled out sooner um and just as a side Cawthorn interestingly broke with a lot of the party on his vote to repeal the 2002 Iraq War Powers Resolution, which was actually used partially as justification by Trump for the airstrike in Iran. So mm -hmm. it was sort of a non-Trumpian move on his part. Mm -hmm. um, what is your opinion? So being prior military, I don't believe that is... I believe you have to keep the American public informed, but at the same time, you can't give away your secrets. Mm -hmm. um, putting putting deadlines out there like we're going to be out by the end of August. I mean, that clearly is um, harmful to all the progress that is made on the ground by, by the troops that are there. It puts the troops at risk. It puts the people at risk. So it's like a security, you believe it to it's be a, a security risk. It's a security risk for, for the people there, um, and signals that we're backing down. Uh, it's not that I don't think that troops should come home. It's just not something you, you know, you advertise. It's something you do incrementally. Uh, it, again, it's well right. thought well, out. I mean, Setting aside the way that it was presented to the public or whatever, what do you think about, I mean, why were we there so long? What were we doing? Mm -hmm. Should we have left sooner, you know, whether it be incrementally or, you know, without yeah. public knowledge? So, I mean, again, I go back to that humanitarian and diplomacy. I believe our military is not just there because of war. You know, we were there helping schools and... Mm -hmm you know, when elections uh, were, you know, being implemented and in the the region and just general humanitarians. Um, so so there are positive reasons we were there. Um, and again, you know, we've been all over the world, depending on the era, 
to to mm-hmm. help. Um, so, uh, you know, I, peace in that area is important to us and our national security. Um, and so upholding those relationships is important, helping the people. Mm-hmm. Do you think, though, that like that we've possibly mismanaged it? Oh, certainly. OK, certainly. Um, well, kind of on, I think, topic with what you're saying, um, you say on your website, it says, quote, the United States must continue for democracy's sake to lead the world as its superpower. We will do this by making friends, not foes. Our overall place within the global discussion gives the U.S. a prime seat at discussions on trade, diplomacy, sanction, military defense, intelligence, foreign aid and global environmental policy. How does that manifest to you? Because it's very different than the much more isolationist stance of America first that the that your opponent has. Well, then, you know, we need to go back to that. So we we are a human race, you know, everybody's lives matter in this world. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have to set aside thinking about governments and think about the civilians of those uh, states in which there are things going on. So. For me, I, you know, um, America is important to me. Mm-hmm. I have missed so many beautiful moments with my family and my children because I had served my country. Um, but on the, the back end of that, you've you've got to understand that you are not the only person on the planet. You know, right. You're not the only country. Um, there are good people all over the world that... Um, uh, don't have the resources and don't have a voice, um, and it's it's incumbent on us to to, to you know be there and to mm-hmm. have those conversations and to negotiate for them with their governments when they're not being listened to. So, okay. So, on that note, what is your view on the U.S.'s role in the Israeli-Palestine conflict? Um, You've mentioned, and I think you are kind of touched on this already, that um, Iran uh, necessitates, the the threat of Iran necessitates the U.S. to support surrounding nations. Mm -hmm. But how do you envision the conflict within Israel ever being resolved? Is the United States backing of Israel, given what they're perpetrating over there against Palestinians, justifiable simply for us to maintain that relationship as a military stronghold in the region. Well, that's difficult, right? Because the, that ha, that conflict has decades, nearly a century, and even longer than that if you really want to go back. Um, so it just depends on the decade and what day you're talking about, you know, uh, who's who's it fault for um, for things going on there. Again, it goes back to the people, right? Um, I think that we need to step outside of that conflict and realize that we should be there to help smooth over relations so that they can concentrate on real threats um, outside of that area. So do you ultimately support a two-party state solution? You know, at the end of the day, and it's up to the people of that area to choose what they want for themselves, and we should be there to facilitate conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I don't think the Palestinians, you know, I mean, they're just outgunned, period. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't have a chance. I mean, I think we can rely on it being factual that there are some unsavory things being done to the Palestinian people, so... I just wonder, you know, how, again, I I feel like it comes down to a a people versus strategy Mm -hmm. and where, you know, do we prioritize our strategic priorities or these just actual human lives? And that's a delicate balance, um, but human lives are extremely important. uh, and, And then we have to step back and look at the bigger picture of national security and making sure that we try to you know, come to some kind of compromise so that there's peace in that region. I mean, there's, it's not an easy feat and it's not one representatives, you know, it's Mm -hmm. a collective. Oh, sure. Um, So. All right. Well then, okay. So assuming that 
I guess the United States is some sort of like moral authority in the world as a as a hegemonic superpower. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you think that the United States has handled the vaccine situation, particularly in an in an international capacity? I mean, I think we're doing really well nationally. The problem is just the people who won't get it, but mm-hmm. um, it's available. So, how do you feel about the role that we're playing in getting it out there to the rest of the world, including the the uh, proposition of taking the patents? away from the pharmaceutical companies so that it can be actually reproduced elsewhere. Yeah, if you read over uh, how how things are run with patents, um, we have to understand that if any federal money went towards the creation of that uh, vaccine, then we have a vested interest. We've funded, you know, we, so um, it's already written into law that, you know, that can be pulled and utilized as the government sees necessary. I mean, that's, that's already black and white. Um, so in general, the, you know, if we can help other nations and the people, again, I go back to, you know, people's lives matter mm-hmm. being, um, you know, a humanitarian in the world softens mm-hmm. people to listen, you know, when it's not a humanitarian issue. So that's how you build those relationships so that you can find compromise in other areas. Um, and not to look at it that way. And it it's important just to get the vaccine out to people and, and, and allow them to um, survive and help them roll that out as well. Um, Right. Well, and I mean, it's I guess it's it's important for us as well because of the variants. Um, so the, the longer the virus continues to circulate on the planet, mm-hmm. you know, the pandemic will continue to be ongoing and could come back here yeah. in another form. So well, um, and, and let me just add to that that, you know, um, vaccines are important in general. I mean, we don't worry about our children getting polio and things like that for a reason. Um, But this virus, I mean, the coronavirus in general, not just this particular variant that caused the pandemic, but I mean, coronavirus existed before that. um, It's always going to exist. You can't undo this, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, you know, just how we have to figure out the next flu strand, you know, this is going to be something that goes on for the rest of our lives and, and next, the next generations so okay what do you think about china's motivations for distributing the vaccine in the developing world and i guess also building a lot of infrastructure in africa are is that altruism or are they trying to move their manufacturing there I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure on that subject. Um, I would have to get myself abreast of of that information. Okay. But, um, I mean, no matter the motives, if, if, if it were to help people, I think it's important. Mm-hmm. But we do have to always look at motives, too. Right, so. right. Um, okay, let's move on to immigration. Should we be accepting refugees at the border and... Just how can we better handle the situation in general? What do we do with all these people and children that are currently detained? Um, so there should, um, it's complex, right? Sure. It's multifaceted. Um, currently, if you can't process folks, which our court system in that area, in the border states, are not, they don't have the infrastructure to get through all of those cases quick enough. Mm -hmm. So of course people are held up. I mean, look at a normal traffic ticket here, right? How long does it take before you can actually get there? So we have to be able to beef up our infrastructure in those uh, border states so that they can process folks that are coming to us. Um, We're not going to stop people necessarily from coming here if they choose to come here. But we should have a better process in order to process quicker and get them back to where they need to go with the information on how to come, you know, to the country legally. Right. Um, and I know you said something that uh, about how, on your website, I, 
I believe it says that it's, you know, there's a kind of a cruel catch 22 in that if you're here and then we tell you go back and this is how the process is the fact that you came in illegally in the first place means that you can get banned from re-entry for three to ten years yeah um so they may come here due to the fact that they don't they have misinformation or they are under the assumption because they had felt threatened that they came here and they were going to be able to you know get in. I mean, not everybody that lives here is fully aware of all the nuances of the immigration law. Uh, I'm not an immigration lawyer, you know, so you've got to think people are coming from third world countries who are, you know, have a lot of things going on in their countries and just uh, have an assumption that they're going to get help Mm -hmm. again because they see us as a humanitarian, you know, and so when they get here, they realize, oh, this is a little more complicated than I'd expected. And then because they step foot across our border without the proper process, now we're going to send them back for three to 10 years. I mean, that, I think there should, you know, not that there should be a slap on the wrist, but there should be just like we do with anything. There should be outreach in a way that teaches people how to come here legally. What do you think about uh, vice president Harris uh, visiting, I believe it was Guatemala, um, mm-hmm. and literally saying, don't come here. Uh, yeah, so there's been some uh, outrage with the fact that she hasn't visited the border. But the border is the end stop mm-hmm. <laughs> of the issue. So the issue is people are fleeing areas where they feel persecuted or there's a lot of crime and things going on. And so she was looking at it from a macro level, Mm -hmm. right? International. I need to go to where folks and and the data, they have the data. They know, you know, the the country of origin from which a lot of these uh, immigrants are coming from. So to go there, to speak to the government, to speak to the people, to try to express a message, look, you can't just. Mm-hmm. You know, hop in a bus or truck on foot here. There's a process. It goes back into that piece of educating. So, people. yeah. So you see it as um, a way for her uh, or us in general to try to espouse the message that you can't just walk in and and access the land of opportunity. There's a lot of paperwork and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So, um one thing, you know, about some people call some of these migrants economic migrants, mm-hmm. and I, and they kind of are more dismissive of those economic refugees because it's like, oh, they're just coming here to make more money. But I would posit that if you can't make a living, if you can't feed your family where you're from, that's violence. So you're fleeing violence, you know, in the sense that you cannot get your basic needs met. And then you also have the component of climate refugees coming from South America, where there are certain places that you simply cannot farm anymore. It's too hot. It's too arid. Whatever the case is, the climate change, where do these people go? I mean, it seems like, especially if based on what you're saying, we're asserting that, you know, we are really one of the most compassionate humanitarian nations in the world. How can we turn these people away? And what do we do with them? Yeah. So it is complex. And those, you know, and I feel for those people. And I don't think that just because you were happen to be born in a place where now, you you know, the, the generations before could survive and now you can't. Uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to try to find a place to take care of your family. We've seen that throughout our history, right? The great, there, there are Irish all over the world because of the, the famine, you know? I mean, that's an example, right? Mm-hmm. So it, there's, there's no difference in that. Um, people should be able to take care of their families. Um, again, it also goes back to finite resources, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there's only so many resources here and you can't bog the system down so quickly that it, it hurts people here either. It's not fair um, to, to the people who are paying to 
to keep our system functioning. So. Okay. And so like in the event that obviously we, you know, the United States does accept some refugees. Mm -hmm. Some people are granted asylum. Would you support Western North Carolina in particular being our representative accepting um, migrants or refugees for resettlement? I mean, that's a difficult question, right? It goes back to resources. Um, that's something that, you know, the government in general, the United States government would have to look at. And I'm sure because we know climate change is real um, and we don't have a, you know, a, a large um, t uh, swatch of time to really figure things out. We really need to look at those numbers yeah, um, it's, ten ha years ago. it's happening. It already happened. <laughs> yeah, it's already happening, but it's, it's getting worse right. is the problem. And so, you know, we would have to look at it. But, I mean, at the end of the day, wherever the resources are, where people will search for those, mm -hmm. right? If if I'm in South America and I can't feed my family, then, yes, I'm going to go where there there's food. Right. You know, so that just is common sense. Right. Um, and it's we need to survival yeah. instinct. God and, forbid people yeah. want to live. Yeah. And so we, we do have to, to plan for that. And I don't think that that's um, a bad suggestion, um, but we definitely have to do it as a, as a whole community, mm -hmm. as, as a state, as a country. It's something that has to be agreed upon, and we have to look at our resources to do that. Okay. Um, you can pull it closer. Okay. Um, so let's go on to a humongous topic, which is healthcare. <laughs> um, so you say there's no one size fits all approach. Um, what, and, you know, that we should uh, not prioritize or not prioritize uh, profits over care and we need to find avenues for all people to be on insured while not burdening employers so do you want to elaborate that on that and kind of tie that into how you feel about the ACA the Affordable Care Act okay so the ACA is a part of the overall right um, we have Medicare Medicaid the ACA and then private insurers. And then, of course, those people that either choose not to have health care or can't afford it. And I think those that uh, portion that can't afford it are the ones that we need to look at. Right. That economic cliff that makes it to where they make just too much too much to get those uh, benefits from the, the state or the, you know, from the government. Uh, but not enough to pay five, six, seven hundred, eight hundred dollars a month in premiums. Um, and subsidies are good, but they're they're still when people are living paycheck to paycheck. If you say half or two thirds of it's getting paid mm -hmm. by subsidies, that's still a couple hundred dollars yeah. out of your check or it's your just pay. Not enough. It's not enough. Right. I well, mean, when you look at somebody's economics of their household. Right. There is. I know. I don't remember what the term for it is, but there's like a coverage gap. Yeah, it's an economic certain, cliff. I mean, yeah, just, that's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what would you, do you think that, I mean, if it was up to you, would you amend the Affordable Care Act, leave it as is, get rid of it? Or, like, for example, do you think that expanding Medicaid, like forcing states to uh, accept the federal money for Medicaid, would, would that help? Well, I'd... I never really understood why the states would not take money to help their people. I mean, that in general just doesn't make sense. It's very strange. Um, and so that's once again, that's one piece of it. Right. And so the ACA does need to be amended. It didn't help everybody. Mm -hmm. My mother included, she had the same doctor for 20 years, went, uh, went on the program prior to, you know, aging into, Medicare and um, and could her doctor no longer would see her because she didn't have the coverage that she had before. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was an issue. Right. And so there there needs to be some amendments and some revisions to that. And there needs to be, you know, some expansion on other things. Um, but it's not a one solution will fix it all. Right. Well, because we have. I talked about this the other day with Jay Carey, but we've got um, a really pretty serious issue with rural 
health care. Um, like a, since 2010, 119 rural hospitals have closed across the country, and 47% of the remaining facilities are currently facing negative operating margins. Yes. Um, so we've got a lot of people in rural communities who probably don't have insurance anyway. If they have it, the providers are getting to be so far away. I've seen um, accounts of women not being able to get, um, like, gynecological care or like birthing you know <laughs> assistance for example within two to three hour drive yeah. of their when a baby's home. coming it's coming right you know? <laughs> so, and they tell you you know we'll wait until they get closer together well people in rural areas can't really do that you right. know and then it becomes a financial burden because we all know about Braxton Hicks right. I mean I went to the hospital a handful of times thinking I was in labor and wasn't so mm -hmm. you think this person and whoever their caretaker is or spouse or, or intimate partner is bringing them two, three hours away. You know, that's time likely off of work. That's time that they had to pay somebody else to watch their other children if they have them. I mean, it's, you know, and, and I, I touched upon that, but we have to have the infrastructure in healthcare, let's pretend for for example, everybody has health coverage. Everybody can go see a doctor, and you know we don't have to worry about the money side of it. We do not have the doctors to do that. We would overwhelm the system. We saw it with the pandemic, but um, you know, again, you touched on it. People have to drive an hour, two hours, especially for a specialist uh, working with the public in the past. Um, I've had people tell me, you know, I'm on Medicaid, but I have this condition. It requires a specialist, and I'm having to drive an hour and a half, two hours away across the, the across down to South Carolina because there's nobody here. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's an issue, and I've I've met that issue with my own health care with the VA system. Um, I don't mind community care. I, I've been treated very well by private providers who are uh, being subsidized to take care of us. The problem is I've had to drive two hours away. Hmm. I mean, it's just absurd. And then you think of elderly vets who may be on oxygen or have other other issues. They can't be in a car that long. I mean, we have to have a little more common sense with our health care. Right. So um, in the realm of health care, what is your stance on abortion, the legality and accessibility? So there are things that come before that, right? And it's educating our youth. Mm -hmm. um, I have four children, two of which are of the age to where they've went through, um, you know, they've went through the sexual education classes in public school, and it does not go far enough to explain what's going on. And I think that the, it should involve um, conversations Mm -hmm. with parents and include parents, um, it's uncomfortable, right? I mean, I grew up in an era where my mother was old enough to have grown up in an era where you just didn't discuss those things. So then you have people relying on the school system to educate their children, and it doesn't, it doesn't go into the preventative, you know, the health effects, you know. I mean, it, it, it brushes over it and then they move on, you know, and that needs to be more of a conversation. And then on the other side of it, preventative. I mean, if if teens and young adults or, or just adults in general don't want to um, have a family yet, then they should have the opportunity to get contraception and to be able to prevent that from ever happening. So I feel like... Um, you know, that we have to move away from even, you you don't have to deal with it if, if you prevent it, right? That's, that's the thing. So. Right. Okay, so then let's move on to the Second Amendment, um, which you make clear that you do support, but it seems like with some caveat, because um, you mentioned some stats on your site, um, that abusers and stalkers should have no access to firearms Five women are murdered with guns every day in the United States. A woman's risk of being murdered increases 500% if a gun is present during a domestic dispute. And then you point out that during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, 5,364 soldiers were killed 
with a gun by an intimate partner. Wait, sorry, I'm getting that wrong. That was, okay, that okay. Was you're saying the more wars. more women were <laughs> killed by a gun, basically, by an intimate partner in the United States than soldiers died in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yes. That's the point. Okay. And, and, you know, we we touched on that area, right? And there's outrage and all these feelings about uh, our place in, in the world. But then you come home and you have more women dying than all of that time frame of conflict. It it just doesn't make sense. We've got to, again, we got to go back to common sense. Mm-hmm. So what do you think are the root causes or possible solutions to all these um this crazy increase in mass shootings and overall gun violence it's become so normative to me now personally um mass shootings and i have um a very dear friend that lives in the netherlands and it's like they just can't believe it Mm -hmm. you know and but whenever there's a shooting they're shocked and i'm not even shocked anymore yeah a a point and i can't remember who made this point but (laughs) if you have a clip that holds that much ammunition that means you're not a very good shot (laughs) (laughs) so clearly we need to try to keep uh those types of um mass killing machines out of the hands of people who have mental health issues. Um, So that's one facet of it. Uh, The other part of it is most people I meet aren't really familiar with firearms, but a lot of people own them. So I believe that, you know, you shouldn't just have to take a safety course to get a concealed carry. You should probably take the course just in general, you know, Um, because a, a majority mass shootings aside, a majority of the the um, shootings that happen inside of a home or when they're being cleaned or a child gets a hold of them, you know, just things that are preventable um, and really alter a family's life when they happen. So, um, yeah, we, again, you go back to common sense, right? Mm-hmm. There's got to be some common sense. So would you support, like, for example, a gun registry, like a federal registry of gun owners? I don't, I have a problem with that. Uh, Personally, I just don't think. um, Like it's a privacy issue? It's a privacy issue. um, But on the other side of it, um, if you were to get mental health help or you were going to get, I mean, it it already exists, right? If you want to get a concealed carry, you have to get it signed off by your doctor. Mm -hmm. And we would think that the doctor is aware of things going on but i honestly with the health care and the way it is feels sometimes like my doctor's not fully in tune with me as a person as a whole so i can see where that would be an easy place to for things to get lost as well so it's it's a difficult one i don't think my doctor could pick me out of a lineup yeah so (laughs) so yeah it's um i don't agree with a federal registry um you know it's it but it sounds like you do realize that there's like some more controls that we need to put in place here yes and on what, a federal level would, yeah on a federal level i think and it kind of goes back to anything you deal with with uh with technology right getting one system to talk to the other system um we have all these local and state entities that have all this information about criminal activity um everything should be talking to one another mm-hmm. we shouldn't have a system and, and healthcare as well you know, if you have healthcare talking, then even if their doctor shopping to get that signature, that doctor should be able to say, "Oh, you know, yeah, this person already their normal doctor is over here," and you know, right? You see what I'm saying? Right. It, right. So we've got to get a, a system in place where uh, all these agencies uh, talk better. Um, you know, the systems talk. Yeah, um, I think I think having act this information it doesn't even have to be public but access accessible to law enforcement, law enforcement. Mm-hmm. um and so let's i mean gun violence and domestic violence i think naturally leads us into um issues of policing and public safety so how do you respond to the current climate regarding the public perceptions of law enforcement and the massive attrition going on in our local pds but i believe in PDs around the country. Mm -hmm. Um, Here in Asheville, we've lost an enormous number of officers in the past year. Well, let me start by saying 
I support police officers. Um, I don't think all police officers are innately bad uh, people. I think um, I, you know, defunding does not make sense to me, and I think it should be looked at. That's a that is a uh, extreme. Let's just take all the money away, and we think we're going to fix a problem. That that you know that's not going to work. I believe, if anything, it's reallocation of money um, so that we can train officers to be more prepared. Um, you know, people talk about m militarizing, m you know, the police. Um, it's really just the equipment, but it's not the mindset. Um, we, you know, when we go into a foreign country, we don't, don't just start shooting, mm -hmm. you know, we, we stop and assess the situation. And I, I believe they're trained to do that to an extent, um, but not enough training. Do you agree that they're under, they're under trained and they're not, um, they're not prepared to use all of this military equipment that they've been given without training. They need more training. Like, I think that APD actually has a tank. I mean, let's just think about that. That's yeah. really weird. And I will say on the, the other side of that, that you can't expect someone who's making $17, 18 $19 mm -hmm. an hour, who may be trying to provide for a family, to want to keep coming to work. I mean, imagine if you come to work every day and the, you feel like the majority of the community doesn't want you there, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, that's tough too. And yeah. that you see a mass exodus because it's just not worth it to them. They want to be able to provide for their family and, um, and be safe and, and, and you want to be wanted in yeah. your community in whatever job you're doing. So. Yeah. I actually, I mean, I've done some research on this in the past for another project that I was working on, and I did a small um, study here of 100 participants, and there's also been, I think Gallup did a massive study, and mm -hmm. they, they just both reflect the fact that people are do not want to defund the police, but they're also not always satisfied with law enforcement. Like, there was, there's a huge skew. Uh, schism there mm -hmm. um so that obviously tells you that like we need to do something but people don't want less police and that's that's across racial lines too mm -hmm. um and just this is kind of interesting last week um Asheville city councilwoman kim roney proposed freezing um a number of the police the vacant positions in the police department um in other words just saying that they're not going to be filled again mm -hmm. in any capacity and councilwoman Antoinette Mosley dissented by pointing out that violent crime disproportionately affects black women and so with last police how many more black women will die yeah. yeah there's there's a better balance than just freezing all those jobs so what do you think how can we mend the relationship with the public and law enforcement um, and what is the root of the problem you think it's still just lack of training well, it's like a Underpay. training. It, it's like a training, um, I would say, but it's almost like any issue that you have, right? Um, you've got to take. It's going to take time, right? Uh, we, I mean, we've got to look at our history, and we have to look at the fact that we're going to have to spend time, not money, but time repairing relationships in order to better serve the community. Okay. Um, and what are your views on reparations? That's a tough one, right? Um, <laughs> well, first, let me first ask, do you think that it should be something we should look at at the federal level? Or should we do as we're doing now, which is leaving it up to local towns, cities and municipalities to basically take care of it on their own? I wouldn't step on the toes of the people who have been elected in small towns or counties. I mean, if people don't like it, then they'll vote the next election and change it. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, I mean, we've got to look. Mm -hmm. The Homestead Act. Mm -hmm. Not one African American got land. Right. <laughs> you know, um, so let's let's be honest with our history. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't believe reparations should be a pick and choose because that kind of leads to more issues mm -hmm. and can make space for things to go awry. Um, but putting pro uh, programs in place that help 
uh, co- communities as a whole is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. but to try to like um, raise this, the economic status of the black community and level the playing field. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and I, you know, I would even extend that to, you know, the Native Americans. Oh yeah, who were For, here yeah, absolutely, everybody. absolutely. Um, so, all right, let's move on to just overall economic issues facing WNC and the United States in general. Um, so I feel like one thing, well, we obviously know wages have stagnated. Our minimum wage is seven twenty five. dollars um, We've got the whole fight for 15 thing going on. We know that where we live, $15 isn't even enough. And certainly in many other places. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think that I just want to bring this up and see what you think. I feel like it's not spoken enough, the topic of automation and the role that that plays in all of this. Mm-hmm. Because it's not that I don't think really anybody doesn't want people to make more money or do better. But I feel like there's unintended consequences such as, and I used to work uh, for Standard & Poor. And um, so I've listened to hundreds of public earnings quarterly calls, Mm -hmm. and I've heard CEOs, CFOs promising the analysts um, that the payroll line will not move an inch in order to calm their their nerves about wage hikes. Because what they're doing in like McDonald's, for example, and don't I don't know about if these numbers are exactly right, but roughly. They're piloting some kind of automation system that they propose could eliminate 80% of their workforce. And they're rolling that out right now. And that's just them. I don't know about anybody else. I always, whenever I go to Whole Foods, I feel like there's going to be robot people in there soon because they're moving so fast to automating things and technology and stuff. So clearly there's some jobs that are just coming out of the market period and not being replaced Mm -hmm. um and i think that that's all i mean it it, that's somewhat of an inevitability which leads to a whole other conversation about the fact that in some possible present or future world it's just not necessary for everybody to work 40 hours a week um Mm -hmm. with all the automation that we have but it interplays a lot with the wage issue because it's obviously raising wages which again i don't think anything anyone would say is a bad thing but it is causing this unintended consequence so what can we do for people you know who are just not making ends meet and they're facing up against these corporations who are you know just Mm -hmm. gonna get rid of them yeah well i had proposed an idea where uh we tie wages the minimum wage for an area based on cola i mean those index indexes exist already and so um in order to uh kind of have the market adjust to have those jobs in more rural areas your payroll is your largest expense typically as a company and so if you're if you're able to pay less because the cost of living is less, then jobs will go there. Now, you have mom and pops inside of larger cities that that could affect, so there's got to be some kind of maybe grant system to protect mm-hmm. that. Maybe like a tax incentive or something. I mean, for companies under a certain size. Under a certain size um, would probably be the best way to protect those small mom and pops that are within those higher index areas. Um, but yeah, I, you know, for the companies who are going to automate, if you're going to reduce your, uh, payroll that much, then you have leeway in your bottom line now, right? Mm -hmm. To pay the people that are still with your company more Mm -hmm. money. Um, so it, it goes back to basic numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it's like, where do all those people go? Right. You know, I right. Mean, and that's why we need to bring more manufacturing back here. We need to look forward into the future with, you know, a, a green economy um, and <laughs> just build things here. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the biggest thing. And we have to educate people now for those jobs because right. in order to make it happen we'll have to have the workforce that's got the skill set to do it so 
you know, tied to wages is housing security, which is obviously an issue everywhere, but it's a huge issue in Western North Carolina. Um, Asheville is probably the worst, the epicenter of the housing crisis, but it's, you know, it's really our whole region because uh, it's a very desirable place to live, not only because it's beautiful and it's fun and whatever, but the climate, um, you know, we've got people, you know, as I said to Jay Carey the other day, who they sell their studio apartment in San Francisco for half a million dollars, and then they come here and buy they can house. they can buy a big house for themselves, you mm-hmm. know. And so then our local workforce, our working class, they can't compete with that. And the housing prices, as I'm sure you know, are just skyrocketing. Yes. Um. And so, you know, I know that people traditionally believe that housing bubbles if you will will burst but i just put forth that i don't think that's the case with Mm -hmm. western north carolina i think it's unique because of the climate because people are coming here from the coasts where they're bringing in their money from outside economies and again competing for housing with our local, some native folks Mm -hmm. who, you know, work in the service industry and just simply can't find housing. I I completely understand. Um, It took us a while to find a house that would fit our family because we have four children. Um, And so that was difficult. Um, And, and we, we talked about the economic cliff earlier. So for, for those, I apologize. Um, and so for those folks um, who are in that area where they're making just a bit uh, more than they can get, say, you know, subsidies for housing um, or live in certain places where they, you know, they get a reduced uh, cost to them, um, there's, a, there's a cliff. And so unless you're making a whole lot of money uh, or a a whole lot less money you're under the poverty line then then you're faced with where am i going to live this is going to be the majority where the majority of my paycheck goes and so we have to go back to tying that to jobs and i think you know manufacturing again right when we had all the mills and we were making things here we had homes built all around it and the workforce lived near where they worked. They weren't tra- traveling 20, 30, 45 minutes to get to their job, which mm-hmm. is happening now. And that's a burden and that's a cost. Um, so, yeah, I think between, you know, doing the cost index where people will then have more jobs closer to where they're at and where they can afford to to live and, you know, it, it works. But we also have to have that, um, a friend of mine called workforce housing, mm-hmm. that middle of the road people not super well off but not under the poverty line that we that that is affordable to them yeah i mean we have a huge problem with that Mm -hmm. and you know and then locals uh generally tend to oppose development Mm -hmm. Um, nobody wants to chop up land nobody wants to change you know but i feel i you know but at the same time like i always say i don't like to change either but we can't stop them from coming here. You literally cannot stop somebody from bringing their money and buying mm-hmm. a house here for 200000 over the asking price to beat out somebody else. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's the way our economy is set up, right? Right. So, And those same people don't want to see homeless population either you know so we have to find you know a place to house the people that are that are here that are you know might get pushed out of the housing market yeah so you're big into the budget and i know you believe strongly in preserving social security and you know thus not tapping it as we the trust as Mm -hmm. we have been um what do you think about you know a wealth tax and um ending corporate welfare as a way to fund things because you know you you're very clear that you know if we don't have the money we don't have the money yeah so that naturally begs the question where can we get the money why are there you know five people running around with most of the wealth in this country as individuals i don't you know you can't look at it from that perspective but people who create jobs are necessary too right so um we don't want to 
make it an economic burden, but at the same time, we have to build some kind of incentive where they do the right thing. Um, and so uh, there are companies not paying anything in, in income tax. And, you know, we just there there's a happy medium and clearly tax uh, law has, you know, the IRS, there needs to be a lot of revisions there. Um, but I don't think that we should go after the problem that happens. And it's similar to that economic cliff is that n then you have those companies that are just just successful enough to expand a little time and it takes money to expand and create those jobs but then they get lumped in with those really big corporations um, and then it ends up harming them some of these rules and laws so it, it's a delicate balance and we can't we can't go at it just with a swift broad brush either so um yeah well i mean it's just things like and this goes back to the wage thing i'm sure you know that walmart you know is basically it, it, indirectly our biggest food stamp recipient in this country mm -hmm. in terms of that its employees are so underpaid that um we as the american people have to pay for walmart employees to eat mm -hmm. yeah that's it's kind of troubling <laughs> <laughs> it's very troubling yeah. and they're not the only corporation and, absolutely um, yeah. yeah um okay well then i'm going to kind of start moving along a little bit faster yeah. here <laughs> um so we can talk about education um how do you feel like we can go about leveling the playing field in our public school systems both here and nationally because because school quality is generally tied directly to the wealth of the community yeah, to property tax mm -hmm. right and um, then of course I know you you speak a lot on broadband availability I think that the pandemic has really shined a light on those inequities about uh, broadband access and um, so you know I guess how can we approach this and also do you think that broadband is a utility like oh it definitely is a human right in, in, the, in this because of the economy we have and, and the reliance between job, health, and education, people can't live without it anymore. Right. It's just not something that they can do. The other side of that is that $65 billion that's coming down the pipeline over the next eight years for broadband is great. And I've spoke to local um, folks who are very deep into broadband, <laughs> and they uh, they said, you know, we're, we're seeing this money kind of come down like an avalanche, but there's no plan. <laughs> How do we roll out when you're dealing with private companies or you're piecemealing? Um, so there's definitely going to have to be some um, collaboration mm -hmm. for that money to actually benefit the people it was intended to benefit um so yeah okay. that that's a that's going to be another big one over the next couple of years all right do you support loan forgiveness or free community college you know uh free community college again sounds great right just like free health care or anything mm -hmm. else but somebody it's not free right mm -hmm. we have to pay the professor's salaries pay for the uh, facilities and and power and you know so somebody's paying for it um well, I, I mean should the government pay yeah, for it well the government is us right, right. <laughs> we fund the government so right. it's the people that would be funding it and so we have to look at it like an investment mm -hmm. in our youth and if we're willing to work f going forward to bring jobs back to the country, manufacture things here. You know, um, the reason that trades are getting paid a little bit better nowadays is because there's so few of them. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not as uh, people just aren't going into them at the same rate they were 50 years ago, right. you know, because of technology. But we also have to educate our youth in order to be able to innovate and compete on a world level, right? Mm -hmm. We have to look at our where you know it's just like anything right where do you want to invest mm -hmm. and i think investing in our youth is important yes remember they're the ones going to take care of us when we're old right <laughs> <laughs> um so like i just have one last question on mm -hmm. education which i ask everybody this currently anyone convicted of a drug related offense is ineligible for a pell grant or federal student loan and this is down to like final possession charge mm -hmm. um 
would you re support removing that restriction? Because literally an actual rapist, like a serial rapist who's free can get Pell Grant, but somebody who got caught with marijuana, marijuana mm -hmm. in a state where it's illegal or whatever, just, you know, partying when they were young and now they're going to pay for that forever in the sense that they would have to pay out of pocket yeah. to go to school. Um, I think we really have to look at how we punish people for so long. Um, clearly, there are some um, criminal activities that, uh, you know, you really need to keep your thumb on and, mm -hmm. and not let them uh, have as much access in the community. Um, but, you know, we, I mean, how many states is marijuana legal now? You know, but there's still people sitting in jail. Right. Um, and we are all paying for that, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and we're not making money off taxing the marijuana. Yes. I apologize again. Right. <laughs> I have children, so th okay. those are for them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I d you know, the, the kid who had a small possession charge at 18, 20 years old, and now they're 30, and they're trying to go back to school to re-skill uh, themselves for the for the job market should not be punished. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so before we wrap up on policy, are there any other topics that you'd like to address that we haven't touched upon yet? I think we've touched on a lot. We've done <laughs> an hour. <laughs> yeah. And we've gone over a little bit. So um, let's just talk really briefly about the party as a whole. It's clearly very splintered. Um, can this chasm be closed? Some of the people on both the right and left are what I personally refer to as beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, the left has its counterparts to your insurrection types as yes. well. You know, so we have to be honest about that. And so those kind of people on either side but particularly on the Republican in the Republican Party, is how do you reach them? I mean, are mm -hmm. you trying to? Would do you want to re try to reform them, or just almost like focus, just focus on the the middle on both sides? You know what I mean? Kind of cut off the extremes. Because I mean, can yeah. those people be changed? <laughs> I don't know. I, personally, I think that we can look at it like a bell curve, right? Mm -hmm. You got your two percent, two point yeah. five percent on each side. Yeah. That's all. They've always existed. Right. The difference is they're out in the spotlight. Right. They're now. louder. Right. And the squeaky wheel gets the, the grease. The grease. Yeah. So um, the majority of the Republican Party, uh, you know, loves our country. They love one another and their neighbor. Uh, they and they want the same things that unaffiliated and independent and Democrat want. They want to have a job. And some some security, you know, they want to mm -hmm. they want their family to be healthy and for themselves to be healthy. And I think at the end of the day, we have to stop feeding in to the extreme ends and and really find a way to compromise and um, and get along with one another. OK, so uh, then one last thing. What is your opinion on the two party system in general? Do you think it limits progress? Because the RNC and the DNC are both machines in their own way. Mm -hmm. They're both very difficult to penetrate. Uh, it seems as though candidates are not really voted and they're chosen. Um, you know, like the way the DNC, for example, it's widely believed that they closed ranks to get Biden in office by, you know, convincing all these candidates to drop out because he wasn't doing that well in the beginning. Um, well, it's it's something right for that many people to come together and agree. I'm going to back off. Mm -hmm. I don't I no longer think that I'm that good of a candidate that uh, it would behoove of us to work together and this is the right way to go. Right. That's compromise, right? Right. So both sides do it. Um, there has to be a compromise within the parties themselves. Um, I believe that it just takes all spectrum, whether they're, you know, middle of the road, middle of their party or far in their party for, for there to be compromise and all voices should be heard. That plurality matters. And, um, and so we just, you know, 
I, I think the two party system is what we have and mm-hmm. it has worked well when it's working and that we just need to kind of fall back on um, on our foundation. OK. All right. Well, I am going to just do a rapid fire and oh, wow. some of okay. these maybe we already talked about, but just kind of to summarize and then touch upon just quickly a couple of things that we didn't talk about. Mm-hmm. So just a simple yes or no or a couple word answers. Yes. Legalization of marijuana. I don't see a problem with it, honestly. Death penalty. It should be restricted for the most heinous crimes. Okay. For-profit prisons. I don't think anybody should be making money off of crime. Legalization of sex work. Honestly, (laughs) morally, that's no, you know. Okay. Um, Assault rifle ban for citizens. Again, that one's a complex one. I wouldn't say a mass yes or no on that. Okay. Mental health screening or improved mental health screening for gun um, ownership. I wouldn't say gun ownership in general, but for certain purchases, uh, yeah. That, that like for high powered weapons or, okay. Um, the filibuster. <laughs> the filibuster used to work, um, but this new one is, you know, making it almost impossible to get anything accomplished. Right. Um, Allowing Biden to appoint a Supreme Court justice. Well, if a seat is open. Ex- well, then- <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, well, McConnell has asserted already less than a year into his presidency that he was he's already it's already too late. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, mean, let's, let's, I would say quick, easy answer. Don't be hypocritical. Mm-hmm. Right. Whoever the president is at that time, that's their duty. Yeah. Um, trans women in sports. I really honestly don't have too many of an opinion on that. I, I, you know, everybody should have, have the opportunity to, to be in sports. To play. Mm-hmm. Um, emerging bills restricting children from medically transitioning that we're seeing popping up all over the country. That's, that's a tough one. I have four kids. They change their mind a lot. Um, <laughs> I don't think that children that feel that or adults that say they felt that way as a child are wrong then Mm -hmm. I feel you don't think so no I don't I think that they know who they are Mm -hmm. and none of us including parents of those children can assess whether it's accurate or not when they're children Mm -hmm. that's my personal opinion again because children can change their mind would you legislate it though I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily legislate it to where um, it would I guess I would ask what exactly you see that being um, because. Well, they're trying to make it so that in certain states that so that like if you're under a certain age, either 16 or 18, your parents cannot sign off on like you getting puberty blockers, for example, or starting HRT. Um, So that's kind of what I'm talking about. Like, should we legislate it or is it just, you know a personal thing like abortion like you don't necessarily have to support it but it's not your business i mean honestly i don't feel like it's my business right the government's business okay um and i think we probably should look at how young we allow people to get married in this country before we worry about things like that fair enough (laughs) um naturalization for undocumented people brought here as children that's a tough one too because it wasn't their choice exactly so we need to keep that in mind when we're we're looking at that population. Right. Because, I mean, you hear stories about people being deported to a country that they don't even remember being in. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, then, this has been a long one. Once again, you've been listening to WPVM 103.7 on your dial and globally at WPVMFM.org. Thank you again to NC11 Republican congressional candidate Wendy Navarros for joining us in studio today to share her campaign and platforms with the community. If you wish, you may find more information about Wendy Navarros at the website wendynavarros.com or on the Wendy Navarros for Congress Facebook page. Don't forget that you can view this